Hello. Welcome to our second session about electric field. We have three goals today. We're going to look at the motion of charged particles in a uniform electric field. We'll talk a little bit more about the net electric field from uh, multiple charged particles. And finally, we'll do a bit of an example problem uh, that relates to field. Okay, so here's our connection between electric force and electric field. F, the vector F, is Q, the charge, times the electric field. So in words, you could explain that equation as follows. When an object with a charge Q is placed in an electric field of magnitude E, the object experiences a force of magnitude QE. And of course, force and field are both vector quantities, so we should talk about directions as well. So if you have a positive charge, then the force and the field are in the same direction. If you have a negative charge, then you multiply a negative by the vector E, and the force is in the opposite direction. So the force is opposite to the field if Q is negative. And this equation, F equals QE, is completely analogous to the equation we used a lot in the gravitational situation. Gravitational force is mg, we said. So if you know what the value of g is at a particular spot, you take an object with a particular known mass, you stick it at that spot where you know what g is, and you know the force, gravitational force on it. And of course, in the gravitational situation, the mass is always a positive number, and so the gravitational force is the same direction as G, the gravitational field. Okay, so let's consider this particular scenario. There are four charged particles uh, at the corners of a square. Red charges are generally positive, blue ones are negative. And in the middle of the square there is a fifth charge and that guy is uh, positive. Okay, so focus on the guy in the middle, the positive charge in the middle. So it feels a force directed straight down at that point. And what that means is the field at the location of that charge is directed straight down because the force and the field are in the same direction at that point. Okay, so now we're going to animate this a little bit and see what happens. And first of all, we're going to change the uh, charge in the middle from positive to negative, and you see now the force goes up. The field is still down, but the force on the negative charge is in the opposite direction of the field. Now we make the charge positive again. And now we're going to drag it around and just sample the, the field everywhere. Now one thing you notice is that as we drag that one around, the arrows on all the other charges change as well. That's because dragging that charge will change the field, the net field experienced by all the other ones. Okay, but what we're really doing is we're dragging this charge around and we're, we're letting it sample the field for us. And so we get a feel for the direction of the field at any place and the magnitude because the arrow shrinks and grows as the field goes down and up. Okay, so let's consider some charged objects in a uniform field. Now in the picture here, it's hard to tell, but in the background, there's kind of these green arrows, and they all point down. There are equally spaced green arrows all pointing down. So this is a uniform field here. Now, let's go back to what we learned before. We take an object with mass, like a baseball, and we throw it into a uniform gravitational field. Where might we find such a uniform gravitational field? Well, the one near the surface of the Earth is a pretty good approximation of a uniform field. So what does that baseball do? Well, it's going to follow a parabolic trajectory, parabolic path. We've seen that a lot. Okay, now if we do the similar thing, the analogous thing for a charged particle in a uniform electric field, well, it's all the same physics, so we get the same kind of motion. We get, again, a parabolic path. And how did we analyze the baseball? We applied projectile motion methods. In other words, we applied constant acceleration equations. And so we can apply the same ideas, the uh, constant acceleration equations, just with a different acceleration in general, 
won't just be g, it'll be uh, qe over m, our acceleration. And you get another difference, is that the positive charge will go, will feel a force in the direction of the field, where a negative charge will feel a force opposite to the direction of the field, so the negative charge falls up. And you never see that with baseballs. Okay, so let's see this in action. Okay, so first of all, we'll take our baseball, the object with mass, and throw it into our uniform gravitational field, and it follows our traditional parabolic trajectory. Then we'll switch over to the positive charge, and in this case, we've given it exactly the same acceleration as the baseball, so that the path is the same. And then here's our negative charge, which falls up. Okay, so, but the physics is all the same. So, all that uh, projectile motion stuff that we learned about previously, we can now apply to situations of charges moving in uh, constant, uniform uh, electric fields. Okay, now we're going to talk about something we call a test charge. So, what is it? So, as we saw a few minutes ago, when we had five charges in a square, four at the corners and one in the middle, and we were moving the middle one around, as we moved the middle one around, it affected all the other ones. Okay? So, we're going to imagine something called a test charge, which has a small enough charge that it has a, it has a negligible impact on the local electric field. Okay? And that's kind of nice, because then it just allows you to sample the field everywhere without, as you move it, changing the field. Okay, so just as we saw before, if you put a positive test charge at a point and look at the force on it, then you will get the direction of the field at that point, because the field is the same direction as the force on the test charge. This is why we generally use positive test charges. And we'll get a good idea of how strong the field is if we look at the size of that force. And again, we're applying F equals QE. And here we're using positive test charges, so the force and the field are always going to be in the same direction as one another. Okay, so we're going to see an animation of this. So this is a very similar scenario. Okay, so we got a little positive test charge in the middle here and four charges at the corner of the square. And as we drag the test charge around, the other guys, the charges at the corners, don't feel anything. And we're sampling the field at various spots. And what you get, the information you get out of the test charge, is totally consistent with what you get out of this field vector uh, version of the um, field line pattern. And so we can see, for instance, there's a place where there's almost no field there in between the two negative charges. And as you drag the test charge around, you get uh, similar information to what you get out of this whole field vector picture. But dragging the test charge around will not change the field vector picture itself, okay? Because the test charge is so small, it has a negligible impact on the local field. Okay, so now we'll do an example here using this test charge. So here we have the net force on a positive test charge, the test charge is the little red dot at the center of the picture. It feels a force which is kind of down and to the left at a 45 degree angle. And the force on it comes from two nearby charges. The red one at the top has a charge of plus Q, and then the green one to the right of the test charge uh, has an unknown charge. And we, we're looking for the sign and magnitude of the charge on this green ball. Okay, and all we have to go by is the force that the test charge experiences. So what do you think, out of this list, is the sign and magnitude of the charge on the second ball? One thing you notice is that all the uh, charges here are positive. Does that make sense? Should it be a positive charge? And how big should it be in comparison to the plus Q at the top? Okay, so see if you like any one of those answers and then we'll go over how to think about it. Okay, so here we go. And we can look at the uh, force on the test charge, and another way to think about this is think about it in terms of field. So you don't have to put a test charge there at the center of the picture. You can just say, at the center of the picture, the field, the electric field, due to the, these two charges, the red one at the top and the green one to the right, 
the field is down and to the left at a 45 degree angle. What is the sign of magnitude of the charge on the second ball? Okay, that's a completely equivalent way to think about this question. So you can always rephrase force questions in terms of field or, or vice versa. Okay, now it's very important here to, to notice that the vector is at a 45 degree angle. Whether it's a force vector or a field vector, it's a 45 degree angle. And that means the two components, the downward going component, which is produced by the positive charge at the top of the picture, and the left going component, which can only be produced by the green charge on the right. So those two force components must be exactly the same. Okay, otherwise you wouldn't get the net force or net field at a 45 degree angle. Okay, we can also confirm that that green ball must have a positive charge because A, the test charge is positive, and so it feels a force that is repelling it from that green charge, and so the green charge must have the same sign as the positive test charge. Or if you think about field, then the field is pointing away from the green charge, so it's going to produce a leftward arrow and that's away from the charge. So only positive charges produce fields that are away from it. So it certainly has a positive charge. How big is it? That's the next thing. Okay, so how does the magnitude of the charge on this green ball compare to Q, the magnitude of the charge on the ball at the top of the picture? So one thing to notice is that the ball at the top of the picture is twice as far from the test charge as the green ball is. Okay. And because the green ball is closer, but yet still produces the same force or same field, then it must have a smaller charge than the guy at the top. Okay, because if it was the same and you went closer, you'd expect to get a bigger force. Okay, so because you get the same force when you're closer, it must have a smaller value for charge. Okay, so qualitatively, here we go. First ball is uh, twice as far away. And remember the distance gets squared in our force or field equation. K, Q1, Q2 over R squared, or E is K, Q over R squared. So that factor of 2 in the distance becomes a factor of 4. Okay, so you've got to offset that factor of 4 with a factor of 4 in the charge. So the ball must have a charge of Q over 4. Okay, so uh, I think that's all for today.